Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we are going to do another tick video. Could Sweden have withstood a German blitzkrieg in World War II? Um, we've talked about this a little bit on the Discord, and I've been doing actually quite a bit of reading on Swedish armaments around the time of World War II and leading into World War II. Um, it's not something that I knew a ton about until this conversation came up, so I've been doing some digging into it. Um, I have my own thoughts on how they would have done against Germany in World War II, but I'll get to that as the video goes along. Um, I like the Tick videos. I think he does a good job with them, so let's go ahead and get into it. My patron, Peter Kadia, has asked, Question, Sweden's capability during World War II. Dear Tick, first of all, my most honest and warm thank you for your efforts making marvellous videos. Now to my question. Our Swedish history lessons tell us that Sweden wasn't attacked by Germany due to a few major facts. First, our silent allegiance was already with the Germans, so why attack friends? Secondly, we were trading heavily with them, so why attack a trading partner, and so forth. But if they were to attack us, we couldn't withstand an attack. Our forces were mainly half-drunk farmers with a hunting rifle standing at our shores. In one of your episodes, you say that Germany didn't attack us because Sweden would have stopped them before they could reach the precious mines in the north. What is your analysis of this? Could Swedish Sweden withstand an attack for so long, or did they abstain from attacking us due to the above history teachings? Kindly, Peter Kadia. Okay, there's a lot to unpack. Is that, is that what's taught for Swedish history? That they weren't attacked by Germany due to this, an allegiance with the Germans? Um, that's interesting. I'm curious how this is taught in Sweden. Like I said, I have my own thoughts and opinions on it. But that was a very interesting way to kind of phrase that whole thing. Here, and I think the best way to answer this question is to first look at the Swedish military and political situation throughout the war, assess whether Sweden did or did not align themselves with the Germans, as you mentioned, and then see what the German plan was for the invasion and if they had any chance for success. I can't possibly mention everything about Sweden during World War II in this video, and no doubt we'll get called out for missing something. So, if you like more information, I'd recommend these two books for you, especially Gilmore's Sweden, The Swastika and Stalin, because that's specific to Sweden. Anyway, let's start by looking at Sweden's strategic situation. Looking at this map, it becomes obvious why Hitler was so anxious about the Scandinavian region. From Denmark and Sweden, Allied planes could bomb Berlin, and an Allied force could threaten an attack into Germany. So, unlike the First World War, the Germans wanted to secure their northern flank. Obviously, Hitler saw the Eastern Front as the priority, but Hitler believed that the Northern Front was the most important of the Northern, Western and Southern Fronts, which is why he kept a lot of divisions in the area, even until the end of the war. In fact, one of the strategic objectives in his directive for the invasion of Scandinavia was to prevent British intervention in the region. And, as many historians point out, the most important Scandinavian resource that needed to be secured for the German war effort was Swedish iron, iron ore coming from her northern iron ore mines. Until Germany took the French mines in Lorraine, the Germans would be dependent entirely on Swedish iron ore. And even once France was overrun, Swedish iron ore was a boost to the German economy, so securing Swedish cooperation for deliveries of the ore was necessary. During the summer months, the ore could be shipped from the Swedish port of Lulu, which required the Baltic Sea to be secured. But in the winter, the Baltic Sea ports were frozen, so the ore had to be moved via rail to Narvik on the Norwegian coast. In order to secure a constant shipment of ore from Sweden, the Germans would have to take control of Norway and Norwegian territorial waters to prevent the British from blockading the route. For the British, if they were to properly blockade Germany like she had in the First World War, then she would need Norwegian cooperation. 
or just disregard Norwegian neutrality, like Britain did in practice. Thus, <laughs> Churchill was mining Norwegian waters before the German invasion of Norway and Denmark was launched, but we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Winding the clock back slightly, in 1925 the Swedes had four army divisions, and as tensions mounted in Europe, this was increased to six divisions in 1936, which they hoped to have had fully mobilised by 1947. Of course, the rapidly evolving events in Europe compelled them to speed things up a bit. By 1939, though, the Swedish military was completely unprepared for war. Some of their rifles and uniforms dated back to 1896. They didn't have enough machine guns, and of the 600 artillery pieces they did have, 400 of them were pre-World War I types. They had no tanks, believing that the terrain in Sweden was unfavourable to them, and the 150 aircraft they had were inadequate even when compared to the Soviet airplanes, let alone the Germans. It's hard to nail down. I said I've been looking at Swedish armaments going into World War II and during World War II. It's hard to nail down exactly how many tanks they have at exactly which point in time. But for all intents and purposes, the, the tanks don't exist early on in the war. Later on in the war, they have tanks that they're they're starting to roll out. The numbers of them are not staggering, but they are some of them are are well done designs. There just isn't there isn't a ton of them. Um they do have a ton later on of like uh anti-aircraft guns, they have anti-tank guns. Um, but the tanks are just something that they're working on. They've pushed some designs out, depending on when you're talking about during the war. There just isn't, there isn't a ton of them. Their, their defense, at least until way late in this, in this process, seems pretty, pretty dependent on the idea that like you were, it was going to turn into an unconventional type of warfare. Gunther, Sweden's foreign minister, told the British in the February of 1940 that the Germans would be able to obtain immediate and complete domination in the air and could destroy every city in Sweden. In addition, at sea, the three Swedish battleships were between 15 and 20 years old, and there was a six-vessel deficit in the essential submarine fleet. Because Sweden had got most of her equipment from abroad, they had a host of different standards for things like ammunition. And once the war started, they quickly ran out of countries to purchase equipment from, since nobody wanted to arm Sweden for fear she would go over to the other side. But the Germans owed the Swedes for- Yeah, and that, that just makes things more of a pain in the ass than anything else. It's really hard to logistically get everything in line if nothing uses the same parts or ammunition. Like, it's it's not impossible to prosecute a war that way. It just makes it much more of a pain to do so. Their iron ore shipments, which were the main strategic asset that the Germans wanted from Sweden, and so started to give them artillery, hand grenades, machine guns, radio equipment, and ammunition. Switzerland also gave them anti tank guns, and Finland sent some grenade launchers. The Swedes also increased their domestic production, which from 1941 onwards included tanks and other armored vehicles. One that's, that's an important delineation to me. 1941 is a super important line in the sand for Sweden in regards to how they could have done against Germany, and I'll, I'll explain that more later. Once Sweden declared her neutrality in the conflict in the September of 1939, the Swedes signed the 1939 Anglo-Swedish Trade Agreement, as well as another deal with the Germans, which granted several trade ships to deliver supplies to Sweden by going through the British blockade. The Germans allowed this because they secured annual shipments of 10 million tons of iron ore from the Swedes, 
and it also allowed them to pressure Sweden into accepting other concessions because the Germans could threaten to cut off this lifeline. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact resulted in the occupation of the Baltic states and the Winter War, which Sweden reacted to by mobilizing two army divisions and by giving the Finns military equipment for free. Sweden supplied 84,000 rifles, 575 machine guns, 85 anti-tank guns, 104 anti-aircraft guns, 112 howitzers and field guns, 25 airplanes, 30,000 shells and 50 million cartridges, partly from its own meager supplies and partly by diverting export orders from Germany to Finland. I can't, I can't tell if this is a move from Sweden out of like some sort of genuine friendship or if this is a, a like a strategic self-preservation move from from sweden because if i'm in sweden's position here if finland gets overrun immediately by the soviets that is not good for my position in the world right i now have a giant elephant in the room in in my region of the world and it is now my neighbor, right? You already have the Germans to the south, and now you will have the Soviets directly to, to the east of you. I mean, like, right next to your border. And so I can't tell if, if this is the Swedes trying to help the Finns because it's like some brotherly Scandinavian thing, or if they see the direction this can go if the Finns fall quickly, and realize like, okay, we have to do something here or else this is going to be us in, you know, a month. So it's, it's kind of hard for me to tell. And that's kind of the case with a lot of this. It's hard for me to tell motivations by the moves that are made. But nonetheless, it was the right move from Sweden. I just have a hard time telling, you know, what the motivation for it was. In fact, in 1937, the Swedes had planned for four possible military scenarios. Three aggressive moves from the Soviet Union, which they saw as the main enemy, and only one from Germany. And up until 1940, it did seem that the Soviets were the main enemy. However, in the January of 1940, the Soviets became willing to negotiate an end to hostilities, and approached Sweden to mediate a peace. In late 1939, Churchill wanted to disrupt Swedish iron ore supplies to Germany. He began by advocating that British warships be allowed in Norwegian waters, and when the British proposed this, they received a harsh backlash from both Norway and Sweden. Churchill then broadcasted a speech on the 20th of January 1940, warning that war would come to Scandinavia. On 16th of February, Churchill ordered a violation of Norwegian territorial waters in order to rescue 300 British seamen imprisoned on board the Altmark in Josselford. This successful operation sealed Norway's fate because, as a result, Hitler and his admirals noted that neither did the British respect Norwegian neutrality, nor the Norwegians assert it. By the time of 1940 and the invasion of Norway and Denmark, the Swedes now saw Germany as their main threat, even though the Germans asked the Swedes to stay out of the conflict. The bulk of their divisions were deployed on the border, with some forces further back to combat paratroop landings. And as the German invasion of Scandinavia got underway, the Per Albin Line, on which millions had been spent, was garrisoned with a few barely trained conscripts who had only 50 to 80% of their required weaponry of machine guns and anti tank guns that most did not know how to operate. From April. So, I understand everybody's like moves here, right? The Swedes, who have a, a major problem in that they have a rapidly expanding German Reich to the south of them and now to the west of them. They have a rapidly expanding Soviet Union to the east of them. They have a British and, and ally group that is kind of pulling them in their direction. They have the Germans who are pulling them in their direction. 
the Swedes are trying to do what they can to keep their head above water here. They have a lot of competing interests that are trying to, to get different things out of them. And they're trying to do the best they can not to drown in this situation, right? Totally understand it. Understand that they have to give concessions to Germany. They have to send the iron ore. Uh, totally get it, right? It makes sense to me. And I understand the move from, from a self-preservation viewpoint. I also understand the view from the British. The iron ore is a big deal for Germany. The iron ore they're getting from Sweden. Well, if you're the Brits, you really can't just sit there and watch that happen continuously over and over and over month after month. You have to do something to attempt to stop it. So they go and they start mining Norwegian waters. Um, they have different kind of plans of attack of how they're going to stop this iron ore trade, right? And if you're Germany, you can't let that happen. There is no way you can allow the British to cut off that supply of iron ore. So I understand the view and the, the reasoning and actions from all of the groups here. It, it makes, you know, it makes sense of why they're maneuvering the way that they are. Now, the outcome isn't going to be great, you know, really at all. But I understand the actions that everybody are taking in this situation. 1940, Sweden was effectively blockaded by both Britain and Germany. Between April and June 1940, the Germans pressured the Swedish into granting them transit rights, which they only accepted in the July after all other options were ruled out. They were surrounded by either German or co-belligerent Axis partners and the Soviet Union, which was currently allied to the Germans. So, without any way for the British to lend them support, they had to give in to German pressure. This was understandable since the Swedish economy required both coal and fertilizers, which only the Germans could now supply. Therefore, if the Swedes didn't want to starve, they had to cooperate with the Germans. Being surrounded placed Sweden in a position that was so bad that when Per Albin Hansen was re-elected as Swedish Prime Minister in the September of 1940, his opponent sent him a one-word telegram saying, condolences. The Germans continued to press <laughs> for further concessions over the next few months, with Sweden concerned about more Soviet moves against Finland, as well as the Allied blockade on Europe. The Swedes knew that they couldn't survive forever without help from outside of Scandinavia, so they created a plan to take Narvik in order to secure a western port, which would allow them to trade with the west, but otherwise they were in a hopeless situation. The Swedes had 220,000 men in the November of 1941, and two divisions could now be deployed within 48 hours to defend the iron ore mines east of Narvik. The British assessment of Swedish capabilities in 1942 said that they could resist a German attack for barely two weeks. At the time, the Swedes confidently rejected this assessment and said that they could hold out for three months. But a German study in October 1943 concluded that the Swedes had shortages of anti-aircraft guns, tanks and artillery, although deemed that Swedish soldiers were well trained in rifles and operations in forests and rough terrain. The Germans believed that the Swedes would fight like the Finns had done in 1939. The Allies also reassessed the Swedes again in late 1943, believing they could resist the Germans for about a month. Okay, so I talked earlier about how I have kind of a line of demarcation between pre-1941 and post-1941 when it comes to this conversation. There's a there's a really good reason for that, and it has less to do with Sweden and more to do with Germany. I don't believe once Operation Barbarossa starts that there is really any way for Germany to invade Sweden in a way that would be even remotely acceptable to to the German Reich. I mean, seriously, that like pre-1941, they have an immense amount of resources, manpower, firepower, everything they would need to prosecute a war. And they've got nothing but time. Who, 
who is a threat? Once, you know, France falls, there really is nothing going on, right? So prior to that point, I think that Germany could have completely, completely smashed Sweden because I think they just have too much of everything. They, you know, I, I talk about this in a, uh, in my How Germany Could Have Won World War II video, but the Germans use more aviation fuel, and I mean like a significant amount more, in a short few months sp uh, period in Operation Barbarossa than they had during the entire uh, invasion of France. I mean, they they had the resources if they needed it to to really just unleash a, a ton of everything. Um, and so the idea that Sweden could have held out, I just don't think that is is reality prior to, to 1941. However, once the Germans turn their eyes towards the Soviet Union, I don't think there's any realistic way they take Sweden in the way they would want to take Sweden. I feel like their only two real options at that point are to have a super prolonged unconventional war or to outright destroy it by air. And I don't think either one of those is really what Germany wants or, or can afford at that point. They don't have the, the manpower and resources for this like quick march in, you know, invasion that they that I think they could have done prior to 1941. And so for this question, could Sweden have withstood a, a German blitzkrieg in World War II? I think it really is dependent on when you're talking about in World War II. Is it early or is it is it post-1941? This wasn't very long, even at this stage of the war, when the German Wehrmacht was weakened by the defeats at Stalingrad and Kursk. But while conventional warfare would probably have resulted in swift defeat, Sweden had taken steps to nurture irregular forces to resist occupation. Swedish rifle clubs had 200,000 members nationwide and a home guard, which was set up in 1940. This raised 85,000 members, who were later supplied with automatic weapons in 1941. And in late 1942, these locally organized units were formally brought into the regular army in order to centrally organize the defenses of the country. A free warfare force was set up as well. This was a secret combat group of Swedish commandos that would be launched into Finland or Norway to carry out behind the lines operations against enemy communications and supplies. So clearly the Swedes had plans and preparations for actions against Germany, and were resistant to German demands, even though they had to give in to pressure in the early and mid-war. But it would... That was actually the... I talked about this uh, in another video. It may have been the history of Sweden and Denmark, but it may have been a different one. There is the way that Sweden handles this situation is either the luckiest thing in the world or it is seriously some of the most brilliant political maneuvering I've, I've ever seen. They have to give into the pressure because they're surrounded, right? But they're resistant to German demands. They had plans and preparations to defend against Germany. That's true. And that's another thing about Germany invading later on. Who, who thinks that Germany's getting their hands on that iron ore, even if they invade later on? The Swedes are, are not letting that fall into German hands. Like, they'll, they'll destroy it before they'll let the Germans take it. Um, but they, they placate the Germans early. And it makes the Germans see them maybe... Maybe not as an actual ally. In fact, I don't think they saw them as an actual ally. I think the Germans get kind of annoyed with the Swedes pretty regularly. But they see them as enough of a, of a back and forth relationship that they kind of skip over them early on when they really could have 
I believe, destroyed them. But because Sweden played it that way early on, by the time that the Swedes become a real thorn in the German sides, Germany no longer has the ability to go and, and really do anything about it. Like I said, it, it works out so incredibly well that I can't tell if it's luck or brilliance because things that work out that well that play out on a massive scale like this tend to be, you know, what's the saying? It's better to be lucky than good. Like that tends to be the way that it leans. But if it wasn't, if this was the plan, it was, it's one of the most, you know, brilliant kind of geopolitical maneuverings I've seen probably be wrong to suggest that they were secretly aligned to Germany since the Germans themselves were frustrated by Sweden's yeah. uncooperative behavior. Germany also expressed interest in the positioning of Sweden within the new German-centric European constellation. Various German officials declared themselves disappointed that Sweden was failing to adjust to the new situation. The Swedes could see the German buildup in Finland, and it was in Sweden's interest not to allow Finland to fall into Soviet hands, nor have Finland go over to the Axis. It was also in Finland's interest to secure Swedish support, and so the Finns offered a political union with Finland in the September of 1940. The Finns agreed... This was smart, but there was no way this was going to happen. It was like, like I said, it was smart. And... and it's the best thing that either side could get out of this. Like, it's, it's the best they could hope for in this situation. But there's no way the powers around them are going to allow this to happen. There's, there's just no way, right? And all of the powers around them want the ability to do what they want when they want to each of these countries individually, that foreign policy would be conducted by the Swedes and Finland would not attack the Soviet Union. But the Germans and Soviets rejected this proposal and so the Union didn't happen. On the 22nd of June 1941, as Barbarossa was launched, the Germans demanded that Sweden allow one division of troops to be transported overland through their country. The Swedish agreed, but stipulated that this concession would be a one-off and that Sweden wouldn't be asked to join the invasion of the Soviet Union. The Swedish king did send a message to Hitler thanking him for crushing Bolshevism and hoped for Hitler's success in the matter. But this by itself doesn't necessarily mean that Sweden was aligned with the Germans, since the Swedes were also negotiating with the Allies. On the 31st of March 1942, the USSR is still the giant elephant in the room. You see that as tensions start to wind down with Germany, when Germany's on the back foot and they're getting pushed back, you see how quickly everybody turns their eyes back to the Soviet Union. So that shouldn't be lost in this, that the giant elephant in the room during this war was the USSR. Operation Performance was launched. Norwegian ships that had docked in Sweden were allowed to sail to Britain after the Allies had demanded that they be set free. The Germans sank three, forced another three to be scuppered, and two fled back to the Swedish ports. Only two may- Was that scuttled? That sounded like he said scubbered. Was that, I don't know, y'all tell me. Made it to England. But, clearly, this operation was not done for Germany's favour. The Allies also repeatedly requested that transit rights for German troops through Sweden be restricted, which, over time, as the strategic situation slowly turned against the Axis, the Swedes began to implement. Swedish opinion became even more hostile following a round of executions in Trondheim, on 6th of October, and the deportation of 532 Norwegian Jews to Germany on the 25th of November as part of the Nazi final solution. Some have argued that Sweden shouldn't have cooperated with the Axis at all, and that their pro-Axis policy was deliberate and wrong. Well... This is a difficult conversation, right? 
because with with hindsight we can see it's very easy for us to to kind of Monday morning quarterback past mistakes like this if if you consider it a mistake certainly like a a moral mistake right however the reason that I always talk about how I give a lot of slack to historical leaders things are very different in the moment if Sweden doesn't give in to anything with the Axis, Sweden does not survive this war. And I'm, I mean that very literally. The, the independent state of Sweden does not survive World War II without concessions to the Germans. I just don't... I, I mean, they could starve the island to death. Like, literally, they could isolate it and starve it to death. And so I, I feel like it's unfortunate that this, like, these are the concessions that have to be made. But you're trying not to have the entire country drowned. And I feel like it's a bit harsh to, with the benefit of hindsight, kind of like pass judgment on people who were literally trying to keep their country from dying. I don't know. That's This is a hard conversation to have because there really is no good side of it, right? But to me, that seems a little bit of like an exceptionally harsh verdict to give Sweden for their, their actions in World War II. Because of the situation that they're in, there just isn't, they're just trying to not, they're trying not to drown. They're trying to keep their head above water and the leaders are trying to do whatever they can to make sure that that's possible. And it works out. That's what like, if it didn't work out and Sweden like gets invaded anyway, or things go haywire or whatever, then I feel like maybe we could be a little bit more harsh with our criticism but if you looked at Sweden, especially once Norway is taken, if you look at Sweden at that point, it has to be at least even odds that they don't survive the war, right? I feel like that, that has to be the case. And so it works in that an independent Swedish state survives through the end of the war. And that's, that's what the leaders were trying to do. That's what they were trying to accomplish. Well, I'm not so sure. Yes, from an idealistic and moral standpoint, Sweden shouldn't have given into German demands. But the problem is, is that if the Swedes had stubbornly rejected all German demands, at the very least, they would have been isolated and their economy would have imploded. And at the worst, the Germans could have invaded in the 1940 to 1943 period. As you will hear shortly, and as I mentioned in my previous video on Scandinavia, there was a German plan to invade Sweden. So, while we can sit here on our lofty moral thrones and judge the Swedes for cooperating with the Third Reich, the practical situation basically forced their hand. And it's clear- I see that, I see it very similarly to how he just laid it out. Yeah, in my opinion, that the Swedes only cooperated to a certain extent, and as soon as they could get away with it, they started to distance themselves from the Germans. The British, at the time, including Churchill, believed that Sweden was truly a neutral nation that was caught in a difficult position, and indicated that they understood the situation. Yes, the British thought that. The US had a very, very much more harsh position on Sweden. But I tend to lean towards the, the British viewpoint. Situation. US opinion, on the other hand, was that Sweden wasn't really neutral and was, in fact, on the side of the Germans. There you go. I didn't know if he would bring the US into it, but yeah. That, so very different opinion between the British and the US at that point. I tend to lean more towards the Brits. They thought that Sweden should be blockaded fully, which they believed would shorten the war, 
and the USA also demanded that the two remaining Norwegian ships in port be allowed to sail back to the Allies, and that the Allies be allowed to use a higher proportion of the Swedish merchant fleet outside her territory. The Swedes had little choice but to agree, although the ships weren't sailed, but their cargo was smuggled out to the west instead. The Germans responded on the 15th of January 1943 by stopping the four monthly supply ships coming into Sweden from the west, and now Hitler realised that Sweden was backing the Allies. In the early months of 1943, Hitler's chronic fear of an invasion of Norway, reinforced by recent events in North Africa and by the growing hostility of Sweden, continued unabated. The North African landings appeared to indicate that the Allies were committed to a strategy of attacking on the periphery of Europe, which made Norway a likely next target. Sweden, regarded with lingering suspicion since the summer of 1941 when it refused to join Hitler's crusade against Bolshevism, became a new source of apprehension in 1942 as its policy towards Germany stiffened in direct proportion to the increasing danger of Allied landings in Scandinavia. If the Allies did land in Norway, the Germans feared that the Swedes would return to strict neutrality, or even convert Sweden to the Allied side. This would cancel German transit rights through their country, isolating their units in the northern parts of Norway if the Allies landed in the south or the middle. It would also isolate their forces in Finland, and so they began to stockpile eight months of supplies in the Narvik area, and began preparing an operational study in early 1943 for an invasion of Sweden. Too late. Too late. There's, like I said, to me, there's nothing that can be done at this point. The the cards that were dealt to, to Sweden earlier in the war are no longer the cards they hold right now. The cards that Germany had pre-Barbarossa are no longer the cards they have. It's too late for Germany to even consider seriously invasion of Sweden at this point, in my opinion. General Lieutenant Adolf von Schell, who was commanding the 25th Panzer Division, was ordered to prepare the study, which he did. Schell had his own Panzer Division, armed with a mixture of German and French tanks, one other infantry division, and strong air and Fulchermega paratrooper support. It was hoped that this force would overcome the Swedish military, even though the Swedish military was at least twice the size of the German invasion force. One portion of the German force would strike in the north, supported by paratroopers, but the main strike would come from the south, over the Norwegian border, with additional forces landing on the coast north of Uppsala. The von Schell plan had the additional advantage of not requiring an Allied invasion to trigger the attack. Germany could equally move against Sweden without it. However, it strikes me as a bit of a desperate plan. Von Schell's first concern was to devise tactics suitable to the terrain of Sweden and capable of execution with relatively weak forces. Deciding that an attack through the mountains of western Sweden would have to follow the roads and valleys he chose to rely on the shock effect of a swift, almost reckless advance. In my opinion, if an invasion of Sweden was going to be successful, the Germans would have had to have attacked in the 1940 to 1941 period, before the beginning of Barbarossa, so that they could muster enough forces to actually mount it. Yes, the von Schell plan may have eventually resulted in Sweden's collapse, but there was a danger that the offensive would get bogged down, and the Swedes did intend to fight on if they lost the conventional fight. So that's not even a it's not that it's a danger that they might get bogged down. I don't think there's really any realistic way they don't get bogged down. And so say you're initially successful with the invasion plans. It's going to turn into a non-conventional war, which by its very essence means it's going to be a bogged down war. I'm, like I said, by this point in the war, I feel like there is no realistic way Germany can pull this off. Well, in my opinion, the best way to guarantee victory would have been for the Germans to have launched the attack in 1940 or 1941, when they could gather enough forces to actually mount a successful attack. 
at a time when the Swedes were pretty weak and mostly not mobilized. Going back... And the Swedes at that point are... are enough of a non-threat and are playing ball enough that Germany decides to kind of skip over them. And so... You can't say it didn't work. To Peter's original question, the Swedish military may or may not have been half-drunk farmers with hunting rifles. But the German force in 1943 was, in my opinion, too weak to guarantee outright victory. In fact, the Norwegian force in 1940 had been barely 20,000 men strong, and Sweden's military was over 200,000 in 1943, and 300,000 reservists were called up in the August. Why did they call up the reservists? The Swedes found out about the attack plans, and mobilized in July of 1943, partly because of it, and partly because they were about to terminate the transit agreement with the Germans anyway, since they were being pressured to do so by the Allies. And this was before the plan was properly finished and prepared. Therefore, to attack with just a handful of under-equipped infantry divisions, one panzer division with half-outdated equipment and some paratroopers, was probably not going to result in a swift victory. And even if it had, the Swedes most likely would have destroyed their own iron mines before the Germans had secured them. So, yeah. was it worth the effort? The Battle of Kursk ended in failure, and the 25th Panzer Division was diverted to France in anticipation of an Allied attack there. The rest of the Army of Norway were in no position to support this attack, as they had been whittled down by troop transfers. They didn't think they could hold against the British, let alone attack Sweden as well. Allied pressure continued to mount, culminating in the Swedes informing the Germans that they would end all military transit for them on the 1st of August 1943. The timing of the secession was favourable, however, as German attention was diverted away from Sweden towards the fall of Mussolini in Italy and a large Soviet offensive on the Eastern Front. Hitler had his hands full, and the termination was accepted without much trouble. So, the von Schell plan fell through, and no invasion of Sweden took place. And the Swedes now started receiving pressure from both the Allies and the Soviets to break relations with Finland. Sweden responded by actively seeking a separate peace for Finland, which she did by becoming the mediator between the Soviets and the Finns. This allowed talks to begin in Sweden between the Finns and the Soviets from late March 1944. A peace was signed that September, with Sweden playing an active role. On the 12th of June 1944, the Swedish agreed with the Allies to reduce exports of ball bearings to Germany by 60% for the next four months. But they explained that they would have to make up the shortfall in late 1944. From July, they stopped transit of coal and cement through to Norway, and later cut shipping to Germany by half. All ball-bearing exports to Germany were stopped on the 12th of October 1944, and all Swedish and German trade ceased on the 1st of January 1945. The Germans responded by formally withdrawing permission for the Swedes to continue receiving their four ships a month from the Allies, even though they continued to receive those ships and the Germans made no moves to stop them. From 1943 onwards, Sweden trained Norwegian and Danish exiles as so-called police troops, so that they could reoccupy their own countries once the Germans laid down their arms. The main reason they did this was because they feared a communist takeover of those two countries, and they didn't want to be surrounded. Yep, again, you see, it's not just Sweden. All of the, the allies on one side you see how quickly their eyes turn from Germany to the Soviet Union once the strategic situation with Germany changes. Rounded again by one power block. These police troops, though, were armed with grenade launchers and anti-tank guns, so they definitely <laughs> weren't regular police. Well, these police troops entered Norwegian territory on the October of 1944 as the Red Army chased German troops out of the north. 
The war now ended on 9th of May 1945, with Sweden intact as an independent and neutral state. The battle for independence against Hitler was now ended. The struggle to resist the Soviet Union would continue for some time. So, to fully answer Peter's question, I think the main reasons Germany didn't invade Sweden was because they couldn't spare the troops during the Denmark and Norwegian campaigns, which went on as the invasion of France was getting underway, and had no real reason to do so in the 1941 period. It was only as the tide of war turned, and Sweden began to be less cooperative with the Third Reich, that Hitler considered invading Sweden. But by then, the Swedish army, though certainly unequipped and arguably incapable of resisting a full-scale offensive, was large enough to counter or at least hinder the weak invasion force that the Germans could spare to attack them with in 1943. Arguably, Sweden's reluctant cooperation with the Germans in the early and mid parts of the war was wrong, but it reduced the need for the Germans to invade their nation. When the Swedes started to be less cooperative, it was too late. I hope that answers your question, Peter. And to everyone else, do you agree with me? If not, how would you answer Peter's question? Let me know in the comments below. I'm curious what everybody thinks about the the question and the way it was asked and how it was answered um put down in the comments what what y'all think about this i see this very similarly to how tick does um you know we've done a handful of tick videos there are things i disagree with him on but for the most part this i i see this very similarly to how he does my one i know i've talked about this before but I tried to draw a line of like delineation between calling Sweden neutral. That's my only issue with World War II Sweden. I am totally accepting of the way that the, they played the hand they were dealt here. In fact, like I said, I feel like it was either extreme luck or brilliance that is beyond historical recognition that it, things worked out this well. But when I look at, say, a country like Belgium in World War I and what they, what they gave up to, to keep the tag of neutrality, it then becomes very hard for me to look at a country like Sweden in World War, World War II and give them that same label. Does that make any sense? Because I try not to be like a dick to Sweden about it. My argument is not that they are an ally of the Third Reich. It's just that it's, it's something different than neutrality. So, I'm, I don't know. You guys let me know what you think about this. Um, I really liked the video. I think it was well done. And it was laid out in a way that... Well, to be completely honest with you, it was laid out in a way that I feel like I would lay out my response to this question. So um, I agreed with, with most, if not all of it, and I'm curious what everybody thinks. Uh, we have conversations like this on the Discord if you want to join. The link will be in the description box below. As always, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here, and I will see you all next time.